The Things We All Carry is a podcast about first responders and their stories surrounding trauma on the job. The intention of this podcast is to raise awareness and share meaningful conversation around a subject often viewed as taboo or simply ignored. Be aware this content may be graphic and it is real. It may not be suitable for children or adults triggered by this subject. Welcome back to The Things We All Carry. I think this is one of those intros where I'm going to have to be real, real with you guys, real with myself, real with, with everything. Um, not that I'm not real with all the other intros, but this is a little more, I don't know, this week has been a little heavier for me, I guess, in a way. And it's been heavy just because I'm realizing that, that not realizing, I know that life isn't linear, progress isn't linear, things don't go from A to B or A to Z flawlessly and what i'm finding is that this journey of mine now this post fire service journey of mine is not flawless it's nowhere near flawless it's actually quite ugly at times and it's definitely not linear um there is i wouldn't say wild swings but there's these ups and downs that these these peaks and valleys that i go through and a lot of it just has to do with me struggling to find my way and then me with with me trying to struggle or not trying to struggle me struggling to find my way it affects how i how i interact and 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 get along with everyone and in this world and it affects everything i um one of the things i tend to do when i go through these periods is i tend to withdraw quite a bit and I would draw because I, I don't want to face the questions of, Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's, how's the podcast going? How's work going? How's, how are your plans going for, for what you want to do in the future? Because right now they're not going, they're stagnant and that's just me. It's just me flat out. I am stuck at times and I'm in a, one of those patterns right now and I'm fighting to get out of it. I went for an aimless drive the other morning and I kind of posted about it. Um, but I went aimlessly driving. I didn't know where I was going to end up, but I ended up at, um, at a national cemetery that's in the town that I live in. And, you know, it's, I know it's there. It's been there. Matter of fact, it, it's right behind my apartment and I, I never visited. Well, I ended up there the other day and I, I started to wander. And as soon as my feet hit that ground and come on, it is hallowed ground. Um, the word purpose came to mind and it, it that, that cemetery rang with purpose. It, it dripped with purpose. There was, like I said in my post, there was purpose in their lives. There was purpose in their deaths. There was purpose in those headstones because what those men and women in that cemetery did was they made, not to put too fine a point on it or too, I don't know, patriotic a point on it, but they, but they sacrificed for us. And that's a purpose. That's a huge purpose. That's a purpose greater than anything, to be honest with you. And I looked at those headstones and some were from the Civil War, some were from the Spanish American War, some were World War I, some were World War II. You know, and they were, they were, there was a wide range of, of dates and, and I'm assuming reasons for why they're there. And, you know, I stumbled upon one. It was you know, this same day as D Day. So my assumption is this gentleman died on the beaches of Normandy. You talk about purpose. I mean, they, they literally saved, saved the world. That's crazy in my opinion. I don't need to save a world, but I did, I do need to focus on some purpose and I need to latch on purpose. And, and I have, I had a number of people reach out to me and, and trying to define what purpose was to them. And goodness, I appreciated that so much because purpose can mean so many things. It can be, it can be a something small and it can be something great. And then you can take those small things, put them together and create something great or something larger. And I think I said that the other day or the other week in my intro, start small, get bigger, get better. And I need to follow that advice. Start small, get bigger, get better. And it's kind of my theme right now. Start small, get bigger, get better. So purpose is on my mind quite a bit and, and. I guess I knew I would lose things when I left the fire service. I didn't know I'd lose a purpose when I left the fire service, but it makes sense that I did. Um, every day I got up to go to shift, there was a purpose right, where there was to, to serve that community and to, to, um, to serve 
the people I worked with, not just the community that I worked in. And I needed, I need to get my mind to flip and realize that my purpose starts every morning I wake up right now. And it's still to serve that community. It's still to serve those people I served with. It's to serve everyone in this first responder community as firefighters, cops, you know, veterans, all of them. That, that is, that is my purpose is to create a better environment for everybody for better outcomes, either as you serve or after you serve. And I think in general, my purpose right now is, is to focus and to stay focused on that task. And, you know, it, it goes without saying that I can't do that in, unless I take care of myself. And so I, I need to make sure that I'm doing that. Um, welcome to episode 129 of the things we all carry. Today's guest is Kenny Mitchell Jr. And Kenny Mitchell is a retired firefighter basically about an hour south of me. And he's just recently retired after a little over 20 years in the fire service. And Kenny is the owner, operator, founder, and everything behind an uh, organization called Operation Yellow Tape. And the reason he has Operation Yellow Tape as his moniker is he talks about the things that happen inside the tape as well as the things that happen outside of the tape. And outside of the tape is the stuff that a lot of us don't handle well. And we take it on and we take it on and we take it on and we, we stuff that down. You know, we, we kind of do the same thing inside, but we have each other to lean on when we're inside. And if we, do, if we handle that right, we can handle the calls and the trauma from the calls. But you add in all the stuff on the outside, that's, it, it, it boils together for, for some serious trouble at times. And so for Kenny, he decided that, uh, you know, he made a comment at a friend's funeral that, you know, well, it's outside the yellow tape. That's what we, that's what we struggle with. And so that's where his, his organization was born out of. Um, one of the things that Kenny talks about is a, is a moment that he had to, to share and to talk with a friend of his. And it was right at the beginning of COVID. And it was, it was on the side of a road, highway is a rest area basically off of 95 in Virginia. And um, he and his buddy sat there and they, and they just kind of, I don't know. I don't know how you say they, they were aimless about it. We'll go back to the word aimless. Um, they just had a conversation that didn't have much depth to it. Kenny didn't reach out and say, I'm struggling and I need help. And he really wishes he did because he thinks that if he had done that, his buddy would have done the same thing. It would have opened a door for his buddy to say, Hey, Kenny, I'm struggling. And I've had a couple of conversations like that where I've said to somebody, man, I'm struggling. And they said, let me tell you what I'm going through. And you listen to it and you go, okay, well, we both unloaded. We both feel a little better. Let's check in with each other again and, and hold each other accountable for some changes. Um, I had a conversation with that, like that, with a buddy of mine who was, who was a good friend of mine. He, uh, we, we worked together on a, on a truck and we, we were, we were stationed together for a couple of years and it was, uh, he was going through some troubles at those times and, and he kind of got through it and things had gotten better. And I, I was detailed into his station a couple of years later and we stayed up talking one night and he was struggling. He told me that he was, he was struggling mightily and he just wanted to talk. He wanted to touch base with somebody. And for some reason I was put in that position that night to talk to him. Two days later, he died. He died in his sleep. And my first thought was, he better not have fucking killed himself. But he died in his sleep, and I knew what was going on. I knew the trouble he was having, and we never got back to finish our conversation because in the middle of our conversation, we got, we got banged out on, a, on an overturned vehicle into a building, people trapped kind of call. And it was one of those that took hours to... to to muddle through and, and make sure everybody's okay and shore up some, some structural damage and all kinds of stuff. And so we came back and, and, uh, my buddy's sitting at the table and, and he's got a big bowl of ice cream in front of him. People who know who I'm talking about know what that ice cream meant to him. And I just, I made a joke to him in passing and in my assumption was I would talk to him the next day. And I never got that chance. 
So the moral of the story and the moral of Kenny's story is when you get that chance, you fucking talk to people about yourself. You tell them what's going on with you and let them tell them, let them tell you what's going on with them because it's too important and we can't waste that time right there. Without further ado, welcome to episode 129 of Things We All Carry. I hope you guys listen. I hope you get something out of this episode as always. Reach out to me. Let me know what you think. Then get outside and do something for yourself. I'm ready to go if you are. I'm ready, man. It's, uh, let's All right, well, it. let's just figure out how we're going to have a, a little conversation today. It's always fun. It's always interesting. So uh, welcome back to the things we all carry. And this afternoon, I am honored to have, um, well, somebody, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and call a friend. I, I, we haven't met in person, but we've been back and forth on social media and, and a couple of phone calls. And uh, he has a very similar outlook and a very similar mission in life right now to what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, and he's, he's actually relatively close. So I'm not sure why we didn't sit down together in, in person, but I dropped the ball on that one. So I'll take the blame. And next time we talk, we'll do it in person and we'll, we'll record across the table from each other. But today I have Kenny Mitchell and Kenny Mitchell is, we go with owner and operator of yellow tape operation, yellow tape, correct, sir. And yes, sir. I'm going to let him kind of tell you his background. He's recently retired out of the uh, central Virginia, Richmond area. And he is, he's adapting like I am to a new life and, and kind of a new mission, but it, it, it kind of stays the same and, and it's in the same, let's go with the same vein or same population. So welcome to the show, Kenny. Thank you for being on. Hey man, thank you for having me. And it's funny you mentioned us getting together because in my notebook, I wrote notes after the last time we were talking to ask you, I should just take the ride and let's do this in person. So that's so funny that we both forgot to mention that. As I jumped out the truck this afternoon, I'm like, damn, I could have easily drove. Yeah, it's, drove a, it's, there. A, it's an hour so, at most I mean, to where I am. So, yeah, maybe next time. But it's funny. I'm looking at a note right now that says, ask him <laughs> about driving. There. So, how are you doing, man? How's life? Life is good, man. I'm, I'm adjusting like you. You know, I spent 21 years and eight months um, career. Um, in two uh, fire stations, uh, I mean, fire departments that ran over 50,000 calls a year a piece. So uh, very big fire departments. But, um, you know, uh, I get asked a lot, you know, hey, man, why didn't you go to 25 years? What made you pull the, the hammer at 21 in, in eight months? Because I was ready. You know, I was mentally and emotionally and just physically ready uh, to take the next step. I'm, I'm fairly young. Um, I mean, I just turned 50, so I'm not, you know, too terribly young, but I always told myself there's, there's so much more to the fire service. And I want to make that 20 years. I had goal, man. I had 20 years and make Lieutenant and to be involved in the train division. I, I made those three and, uh, but it's a transition, man. It's, uh, it's a lot, but, um, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing some speaking and some traveling and building the Operation Yellow Tape brand. Um, honored to be on a podcast that, that such as a platform like yours. So things are going well. Yeah. It's, um, I think about, I think back uh, and you say 21 years and, and, and I, I did 11 and, and I, I know what the transition was for me and still is to this day, what that transition is. It, every day I, I, I kind of have another moment of, Oh, wait a second. No, I'm not that. And this is what my life is now. And, and you know, that is, it is in the past and now I'm moving forward into the future. I can only imagine what another 10 years on top of that brings the psyche when you step away. So that's something maybe we can get into as, as we talk later into the show. Um, before we go any further, what's the last song you heard? You know, it's funny. I, I knew this was going to be a, a, a question. I wanted to keep it real. And as I was stepping out of my truck, counting crows, um, a long okay. December. That's, that's, uh, that's kind of in there. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of a deep cut. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was hoping something more fiery <laughs> and ready to slam the hammer down, but I'm like, Kelly, it's been a long, this I'm like, oh my Lord. Well, well, if you had to go with a different song, what would it be then? Oh man, I would. I'd throw some Led Zeppelin out there. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd hit all it right. hard, man. All right. Yeah. I, I, we're in the same, the same generation. So I, I grew up on Zeppelin, you know, so. Yeah. So where did, where did you grow up? I grew up in Prince George's County, okay. Virginia. All right. All right. Yeah. And explain to yep. people wh where that is. 
uh, pretty short. I'm, I'm about an hour, uh, maybe a little bit, maybe 45 some minutes uh, south of Richmond, right. Virginia. And no, it, it, the, the more the more familiar Prince George people around here is Maryland, and that's the exact yes. opposite of what of what you're saying. Right, the exact opposite. If you know Prince George County, Virginia, um, some of the aligning cities are Petersburg, Virginia. A lot of folks know where Petersburg is. Uh, a lot of people know where Colonial Heights and Hopewell and Henrico, Hanover, Chesterfield. Uh, so I was right there in that area. I grew up there my entire life before going off to to, to school. So we. What was life like growing up? You had, did you have an intact family? Were your parents together? Were they divorced? Was was uh, I, you know, we we always talk about these aces, right? The adverse childhood experiences. Were you on that scale, or do you have a zero? What's the deal? You know, I feel my family life was strong. My parents will be married fifty two years. Jesus, congrats! This this December, yeah, fifty two years this December, and. Both of them were amazing role models for um, for work ethic and, and and dedication and coming to sporting events. My dad just turned seventy two. My mom just turned sixty nine. Um, am I zero in the aces? I'd say no, um, only because you know my dad kind of ruled with authority. You know, there was some yelling, there was some walking on eggshells, and maybe this is going to be something that nobody wants to hear me say something like that. But it's the truth. Um, I tried to parent a little bit opposite to be a little more, it's a different, yeah, different time, yeah. man. You know, to my daughter, I tried to be a little bit different and, and talk about some of the harder things. And I feel like in my family, there's a lot of walking on the eggshells at times. There was no physical abuse. There was no mental, emotional, I guess you could say mental with a lot of yelling here and there, but my dad ruled by authority and you knew, um, he wasn't a fireman, but it makes me think sometimes his job was so stressful. You never knew who you got sometimes. Sometimes he'd be in a great mood. Sometimes he wouldn't be. Um, but fam family life was awesome. Uh, big, big family, lots of uh, get togethers and, and sporting events. And my uncle, uh, the only exposure I had to the emergency services was my dad's brother was a sergeant in Prince George County, Virginia uh, Police Department. And he'd come by during those times in the late eighties, early nineties. And my dad could do ride alongs with them. And it was so cool. Um, and I, I have this memory of, of my uncle walking through the house and his, his belt buckle making that, that yeah. leathery sound and, and my, my family and my, and, and myself, we were so proud of my uncle and how he looked in his uniform and the respect he had, and he wore that hat and kept himself in good shape and had been in some pretty, um, pretty, uh, scary situations when you're a two person, uh, team back then. Um, so that was my first real experience to being around a first responder um, and never really even realizing it until later in life, how some of those sounds and some of those stories and my dad coming home and talking about some of the stories he would uh, experience with my uncle before they lifted the opportunity that my dad could no longer ride with them. So man, to answer your question, uh, I got a brother eight years younger than me. Um, he did something completely opposite uh, that I'm doing, but, uh, very, very good. You know, I'm, I'm proud of my childhood. It, it wasn't um, all roses I, like everybody, but I kept myself out of trouble. Um, I didn't cost my parents any money. <laughs> I didn't end up, I, I didn't. I got so many buddies whose kids cost them thousands of dollars in court cases. I never got a speeding ticket. I knew my dad would beat my butt if anything like that was to happen. So I kept my, kept my nose really clean growing up. You know, it's up. funny you mentioned that, that your dad had a style where you felt like maybe you had to walk on eggshells and, and, you know, maybe some yelling here and there. And, and, and honestly, people are sitting there going, oh, if that's the worst, that's a big deal. I get it. But, but yeah. what I think my point was going to be, I came to reconcile some of my relationship with my dad when I realized he was doing what he was taught. And, and, and he modified his behavior off of what he didn't like from his dad. And his dad was a violent person. He, his dad ruled with an iron fist quite, quite real. You know, it, it was, he was an angry, angry shipbuilder out of, out of Brockton, Massachusetts, who, who didn't relate on an emotional level to, level to his children. And so my dad had to adjust and learn how to do some of that for himself. And so the, you and I, like I said, we're in the same generation. And I think that we, we had to learn as we go how to give grace to them because they, they did what they could with the tools they were given. You're exactly right. And my dad tells stories. I met my grandfather 
his father a couple of times. I remember him, but he, he died in, in the early eighties, but he was a hard dude. You know, my dad tells stories. He was, um, he, he was a hard man too. And I agree. I think every generation adjusts and here I am adjusting to, to my parenting, to my daughter, and hopefully she'll adjust to her because I have not been perfect. I, I have yelled and lost my temper and I uh, didn't show enough grace and, um, didn't lead like I should. We all, no one's a perfect parent. Give me a break. Um, but I'm sure she'll be better than me and maybe we'll continue that. So yeah, you're exactly right. Um, showing, you know, family grace along the way of, of, of growing so up. So you mentioned you, you, you stayed in that area until you went to school. Where was school and, and, and what year was that? Yeah, I went to Chowan College, uh, graduated in 93. I have no idea where that is. Off, well, Murfreesboro, okay. North Carolina. Right. Yeah. At, at the time I attended, uh, the first year it was a JUCO college. It turned four year. My second year, I went there and played some baseball. Um, wanted to be a, a criminal profiler, uh, wanted to do all these things. And, and my baseball schedule didn't line up with my base, with my, my degree. Gotcha. So my coach, my coach decided to pick a, pick a, a field for me, which was so kind of him. <laughs> and he, he picked graph, graphic design and imaging technology. So I uh, graduated from Cho on with a bachelor's degree of, uh, graphic design and imaging technology, and it landed me at the Virginia Pilot newspaper, which is a pretty big newspaper in, in, in Virginia, Norfolk. But my first job with the company landed me in Nags Head, North Carolina, which was um, o- oceanfront view. Um, we'll go bodyboarding and getting in the ocean during lunch breaks. And then one, one day I got promoted, and it landed me in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, in a room with no windows, in the middle of the the city, and um, that's where I stayed for for six and a half years as a graphic artist. All right, so graphic artist, did it not hold your attention, or or what happens that you then become a firefighter? Yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, it 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 was holding my attention. Um, it, it was going well. I had a I had a pager. I had a good Big paying time. job. Big time, baby. I had weekend. I had weekends off. I had holidays. I was making great money. Um, I had a really amazing step program. We were right on the verge of the dot com, which some of my friends right now are um, were in that area, and they made lots of money. And uh, what happened was one beautiful Tuesday, three thousand people got murdered, and uh, that was not eleven. And like like me and so many other people in this world, I something happened to me. I, I don't know how to explain it, but I could not stop watching the coverage. I could not stop. Um, every day I was consumed with what had happened to these three, nearly 3,000 innocent people who were murdered by terrorists. And it it fueled me. And I wanted to get in the fight. I wanted to do something. Um, I thought about the military. I thought about the police, fire. But those firemen watching those 343, it, 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 it got into my soul. And like I say, I, I would go home and after the YMCA, I would go, I would go back home and watch the, the recovery efforts. Um, to make a very long story short, September 11th changed my direction. And by October of 2002, you know, it's a lengthy yeah. process. Um, I was volunteering with Virginia Beach Fire Department. By October 2002, I was on the roster. And by 2003, I was hired full time with the Virginia Beach Fire Department and started my fire service career. Because of 9-11, to be honest, I, I, I knew I, the military w- was really, uh, was really bouncing around. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to make it almost an immediate impact. I, I knew the military would have, but I was thinking, how do I get on the streets in six months? How, how do I do something in six months and still stay here? And I kind of want to have a family one day, I think, you know, I want to have a child one day, I think, and maybe it was selfish of me. I, I don't know, but I, I needed to serve, but I wanted to stay here. I wanted to do all these things and the fire service screamed the loudest. And I, I could not be more satisfied with uh, my choice, even though it's been a heavy, heavy price for all. You, you get into the fire department 2002 and you, you know, you have no connection other than some volunteer time. Then you have no connection to first responders, to fire department, to, to LEO, to anything like that, except for, you, you had your uncle, but you, you didn't, you didn't know much from that, from him. 
So how do you find it when you get in? Like, what do you find? Do you find that it's, it's exactly what you expected or, or, or what is it for you? For me, you know, again, my volunteer time was short because I was hired about a year after volunteering and that volunteer was a support technician, which was non fire mm -hmm. suppression. So really I had, I, we would come to the fires and clean up afterwards. Um, the fire service for me, I've always been very competitive. I've always played sports my entire life. I've always been um, the kind of guy that shows up on a new team and your mouth is closed and you, and you prove with your, with your actions and your skill. So I, I fell right into it. Um, I'm not saying that it was easy because you had to prove yourself to some men who've been doing a job for, I, I got assigned to a very experienced team very quickly, a 40 year captain over a 27 year master firefighter, a, a rookie who has since passed on, unfortunately. Um, he was an absolute stud, but it was what I thought it was going to be. I, I was a probie. Um, I was, uh, uh, I was below whale turds, you know, uh, but I had to prove myself every single day in a job I knew nothing about in an academy that teaches you the very basics. But I, I, I took the approach. I've had a lot of, had a lot of officers tell me along the way, you, you seem like you've been in the military before you, you just have this, you're teachable, you, like a. I actually coach my daughter's softball team. You want a, you want a teachable uh, athlete, someone who's going to take criticism and take, take, take the, it was my fault. Take the blame. So again, to answer your question, it was everything that I thought it would be it was a lot harder than I thought it would be um, mentally and emotionally. The first couple of years, I didn't talk anything about um, physically. It was harder too, um, but it was what I, it was what I had hoped it was going to be. And so how far into this career before you start going, wait a second, I'm feeling some things. I'm, I'm, I'm reacting to things. I, I I'm not processing or whatever. Do you, do you start to build up these calls immediately or do you, do you find a way to process anything? I don't think immediately. Um, I've got a podcast too. And I talk about my journals that I keep. I have, I have, I have so many journals over here that I kept for my entire career. And it, it seems like through those journals, Around 2007 or eight, I started noticing some things, um, some some irritability, some anger, some outbursts. Um, I started noticing a, a huge amount of men and women being divorced and and infidelity and drinking and all of this stuff happening. I remember thinking to myself, "Wow, you know, I think I said it on a previous podcast that this is a, like a big giant snowball happening. We're seeing things that are." making grown men go behind firehouses and pretend like they're not crying. We're not addressing some of this stuff. And I remember thinking that because we ran a hanging one time and those, I know this is a sensitive subject for people. Those affect me badly. And they always did. I, I, I won't ever understand why, but those type of ways that folks took their life hurt me in a way that I couldn't explain. I was unfortunate enough to run so many of them. I don't know why some of us are, are dealt I got guys that have me run one in, in 10 years. I ran a, a lot of hangings and it was one of those calls. And, and But again, around 2007 or eight, I was sort of noticing it was starting to affect me and riding through an intersection, having a yeah. flashback or thinking about something or spilling a cup of coffee and losing my temper immediately. Um, the, the weed you're not starting and me going bonkers on it. Um, so many things that I wasn't, you know, I didn't become a fireman until 30 years old. So I had a long time to, to be an asshole. I wasn't, um, I, I kind of became one along the way here and there through, through not treating some of these things that I went through. So hope that answers your question, but it wasn't immediate. The, the call volumes were immediate. Um, the death and destruction, as you know, was immediate, but it took a little bit, I think. Yeah. You mentioned hangings and, and you say that, that how they hit and, and I, I've always found that I, I found that the hanging stick, they, they stuck in my brain because yeah. I think I had a, a spate of four, four in a year or less than a calendar year. And, and it's just, they just build up, you know, and it's, it's just, it's one of those really odd calls to, to run. And I, I don't know if you can explain it to someone that hasn't responded to that call, how it affects you. It just, it just sits with me and it stays with me. I can, I can see the faces of every hanging that we've attended to. Yeah. Um, I don't think you can explain it either. Uh, yeah, I tried to explain an, an overturned vehicle 
with a person trapped or killed when you're walking up that smell of yeah. the wood and, and oils and the plastics there's a smell in the air of an overturned vehicle with a person trapped or not trapped or hurt or killed um it is a lot of a, a lot of sound and, and noise and things you know what with the hanging is so much yeah. silence it's like the silence is deafening and there's been times where we had to stay there and the person stays there because the, the investigators yep. are coming. And of course, we, we we get out as quick as we can. But unfortunately, brother, I'm sorry you had to deal with that too because it sticks with you and you never forget the faces and, and the sounds, and even though there's not much sound to it. It's one of those calls to me that was so silent but so heavy in, in the volume, if that makes any sense. And it they all stuck with me. And they're all in those journals. And I read some of them that is I'm like, wow, you know, it's, it's, it's really heavy. Stuff. I think that, that odd silence that you experience when you respond to a hanging is, is a, some sort of a respect that you say, Hey, they're still in our presence here. And, and, and you, you just try not to say much. I know that, I, and I, I know what you're saying. I experienced that. I, I know exactly what you're saying. And you kind of, you know, you kind of leave the room that they're in and, and you, that noise, vol the volume starts to rise again. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, they're still here and it's a respect thing. And if you, if you notice, which you did, you pick up on the whispering mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. People were whispering about, hey, hand right. me the box. Hey, people were whispering. I remember being in a room where a, a young female had hung herself and we're all whispering to each other. And most calls are yeah. chaotic and you pull this yeah. drug box out and go over here, over here. It was nothing but but right. whispering, and I remember saying to myself, "This is so quiet, but so, so violent and brutal." Right. So it, it, anyway, yeah. So when it, you these things pile up on on people in general, these calls, but for you, when, when do you go? Okay, now I know. So you say about two thousand six to two thousand eight, you start noticing some anger, some quick to to get angry or some irritability. But do you start identifying those calls, or or is it? Or does anything significant like that have a, I don't want to say a snap, but a moment where you go, ah, oh, that's it. Now I got to get some, I got to do something. No, un unfortunately, um, my daughter was born in 2005. And as everybody knows, after having children, the calls that involved children were harder, of course. Um, but no, I, I continued to plow through it. Um, and so many calls did continue to bother me. Um, and, uh, in 2000 and now we're really jumping forward in 2013. Um, my, uh, daughter's, uh, mother, um, unexpectedly, uh, passed at 34 years old and myself and a police officer, um, were, were first ones to her and I performed CPR and I did all these things and people know the story. Um, that was the beginning uh, of a mental health decline um, in myself that I didn't address um, until 2020. Um, so to answer your question, no, um, I didn't do anything about anything um, until 2020. Uh, I, I didn't want to talk about that with anybody. I, I had to be super dad. Um, I had to get to become coach. I had to get promoted. I had to stay in training. I had to prove that I could plow through this. And, um, that's what I did, but, you know, 2013 on top of what I call outside the yellow tape stuff, um, inside the yellow tape was still piling on the calls, the, 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 the verbal overload at the station with the bings and the mm -hmm. dings and the rings and the constant notifications in the firehouse, everything has a sound and it's always jarring and alarming and it, it means go. That's why people are like, you know, firefighters are jumpy. It's because when something goes off in the firehouse, it's never yeah. meant for you to set. Phone rings, you get up. Tones get go off, you get up. Time for child, you get up. Everything is of this direction. Um, now that I'm retired and I'm working in the private sector, everything is just for people. You can hear a loud noise in, in a building. People like this. And I'm like, yeah. what is that? But no, um, I didn't do anything about any of it, man. Um, I was stuck in the stigma. I was afraid to come forward and, and to talk about how, how hurt I was with losing Jessica. Um, I the survivor's guilt, you know, she needed her mom, not her dad. Um, I had those racing thoughts of, of 
she needs her mom, not her dad. You know, why'd you do this? M my faith hit the ground and it's truly never made it back to probably where maybe it should be. I don't know. Um, a lot of stuff, but from the outside looking in, people saw some signs and some things, but I talked to folks now who are like, my Lord, man, I just sit to your two hour presentation in Williamsburg. We had no idea because some of us, yeah, including you, we're masterful at hiding it. Yeah, we do. We do become masters at hiding everything. It, but it, if 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 you pay close attention, you see the cracks. There, you can't avoid the cracks, and you can't avoid the behaviors that that are the uh, I don't know dead giveaways in some in some sense that there's something going on. And you know, you say that 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 led to that downfall for you, or or is kind of a it is. It's a downfall, and until that 2020 mark, where you're able to to kind of say, "No, I got to get my shit together." What did that look like for you in during that time frame? Um, from the th from 13 yeah. 2020, um, a lot of burning relationships, uh, burning friendships, um, bar fights, um, being irritable and angry and, and crashing weed eaters over top of uh, my, my garage workbench and then having the greatest days mm -hmm. of my life. Um, it, get, getting off work and being as happy as can be, slapping high fives and how's everybody doing? So when my tires hit my driveway, I become a different person. Um, the house doesn't look as straight as it should look. I've been gone for 24 hours. What have y'all done around here? Um, changing into um, almost making my family walk on on, on eggshells at times, but there were wonderful moments too of being promoted and, and working in train division, but man, a lot of, a lot of hidden grief and a lot of hiding behind loudness and fun and, 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 and having good times and vacations, but it was a long seven years. Um, and I, and I don't know why I, I know why, you know, the, the stigma scared me to death. I, I saw what it had done to some men and women who would come forward. They've been labeled, and to this day, people still are. I don't care nobody yeah. says. 2024, a person still is. They just have to fight through it and believe enough to say, fuck you, if you don't think that I'm, if you think that I'm weak because I came forward for my mental health and I don't give a shit what you think. Um, that's what you have to do and love yourself. Um, but I was afraid to do that. You know, I, didn't have the, I didn't have the courage to look at you and go, F you, I don't care what you think about me. I was, so a lot, man, all, all sorts of things. Luckily, no DUIs. Luckily, nobody injured severely. Um, I think hurt people hurt people. Um, when my parents would watch my daughter to give me a, a break on the weekends or times, I would go out and I would find myself in a scuffle. I'd look for somebody that was being an ass clown and I would, I would make them have a problem. And sometimes I'd get the worst end of it. Sometimes they would. And it was it's just a, a roller coaster of seven years. Um, I'm lucky I kept my job sometimes. I um, had some friends that looked after me, uh, but it was, uh, it was a long seven years. So 2020 rolls around and you say, no, this has got to change. Well, unfortunately, it, unfortunately in 2020, I met a pretty good close friend of mine, um, Tom Showalter, um, COVID had just hit and him and I were going to meet for lunch regardless six months before that. And we were like, well, let's meet anyway. So we decided to meet off of Interstate 95 at a rest okay. area and we got lunch and we sit there and we talked and we talked, you know, because only guys in the uniform can right. talk to each other, right? I'm wearing turnout gear. You're the only person I can talk to. So if you don't wear the gear, can't talk to you. Well, um, after sitting there for over four hours talking, you know, there was so much on my mind. I wanted to say, I mean, I, I wanted so bad to say, Tom. Man, I am struggling. I ha I feel like I'm I'm having an anxiety attacks sometimes. That sounds so weak to say. Um, I I'm just angry. I'm I'm mad at times. I said nothing. Um, I went uh, south. He went north. And 17 days later, he took his life. And he lives on my wrist. Um, in 2020, we had one of his memorial services, and I got, I'm sitting there. And there's all these people walking around, and they're saying there's nobody to talk to, and and, and this keeps happening because there's no one for us to go to. And I was writing on a little napkin of mine and I wrote down this little phrase, there are too many of us that ever feel alone. And uh, a person sat beside me and they brought that up. And I'm like, what do you mean there's nobody to talk to? Well, look around here. There's hundreds of people to talk to. And who, what am I doing? Yeah. Wasn't talking right. to anybody, you know? 
So fast forward, man, a couple of months, I said, I'm done. I am done with this. I am going to speak up about myself. I'm going to talk about my hypervigilance. I'm going to talk about my depression. I'm going to talk about some of my anger. And I'm going to put it on Instagram for the whole world to see. And I'm going to do something about this. And honestly, man, um, that mixed with some counseling and some different things is what got the ball rolling for me. Um, coming forward um, out of the darkness, um, Tom taking his life was a huge jolt to me. I, I could not believe that I sit with him 17 days prior. And as good of friends that we were, and we're surfing and, and bodyboarding and, and Topsail, North Carolina, and why didn't we talk to each other? You know, I, I think back right now, if I had only said, man, I'm struggling, he probably would have said, me too. But we didn't because we had that mindset of we cannot tell each other we're struggling. But then we had that mindset of we can only talk to those folks right. in the uniform. That's why I've tried to dismantle that from the go. Got to talk to folks who aren't in the uniform as well. But th that was the turn for me in 2020. Unfortunately, another uh, horrific loss. But I, I had to turn this around um, in my life. And in those folks around me who I saw were sinking after Tom, I had to, I, we got to pick each other up and move. And forward. how did you find it when like you start, you're, I'm going to get on Instagram. I'm going to share the, the intimate details of, of my psyche, of my depression, of my anxiety, of whatever it is. It, 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 it's cathartic in a way, but it's also like, it's all, it's, it's overwhelming at times as well. Yes. For me, I, I woke up one morning, I, I kept putting it off and I, I just came in this room right here and I set, I set my phone up beside that little fire truck and I just spoke into it. It, it might still be on my Instagram page way down and I, I called it, I think I called it Saturday's mental health something. And I just started to talk about losing him, about hypervigilance, about sadness, about how I'm out here cutting the grass, but all I can do is think about some of the regrets in my life. And then I went back out to cut the grass. And when I came back in, it was just this on, there's so many messages and people from all over the world saying, dude, I, I feel like you feel, I think my wife may have what you have. I think my wife is struggling too. My, my, my husband, my uncle, my aunt, my cousin, my, my neighbor, I've seen him punching his, his lawnmower, you know? So. Yeah, it it was freeing, but also terrifying because I had some phone dreams saying, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> you, 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 you were a lieutenant in the fire service and you're on social media talking about hypervigilance and depression. I said, yeah, I'm a leader right. in the fire service. And it's about time some leaders step up. I don't care if you're a lieutenant or not. If anybody in the fire service, you need to consider yourself a leader, you know. Um, you need to lead and step up. And and I've been lying and, and hiding for too long. So if you don't like it and it stops me in my tracks at an LT, I don't care. And um, I kept on talking and I'm hit, sitting with you now, continuing to push it. And, uh, but yeah, it's terrifying. It's, it, I think my family was like, what are you talking about? What's what's going on? You know, we don't talk about yeah. that stuff in our family. You know, we have World War, World War II heroes and veterans. And what do you mean you're anxiety levels, you know, it's so terrifying. So how do you, how do you come around to Operation Yellow Tape and, and, and what is the basis of Operation Yellow Tape? Operation Yellow Tape was born, of course, at his memorial service. But when I came home that day, I thought to myself, I told a person that day, they asked me, they said, they, they said, Kenny, yeah, this job sucks. That's why this keeps happening. I said, no. That that's not true. You know, this job is hard. It does suck at times, but inside that yellow tape, it, it is tight. And I actually said those words. Inside the yellow tape is hard. You know, we're starting IVs. It's bloody in there. It's cold. Sometimes it's really fun in there. Sometimes we're putting a smoke alarm at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, but it, inside the yellow tape is difficult. I said, but but man, it's outside the yellow tape. It's outside. That, that, that we don't address. It's the divorce. It's the child custody battles. It's watching our, our parents age. It's watching ourselves go through promotions, demotions, hiring, firing. It's watching our kids become uh, growing up. And it, there's so much stuff outside the yellow tape, bankruptcy, just things that we don't address. Hey guys, quick break right here just to check in and thank each of you for listening to the show. 
Your support has been paramount, and I appreciate all of you. I have one request, though. I need you to share the show with everyone you know. Help me get the word out and spread these stories as far and as wide as we can. While you're at it, please leave a review of the show wherever you happen to listen. Feel free to reach out to me at any time to share your story, to talk, or to pass on suggestions. Let's get on with the rest of the show. And then when we do not address them, we go back inside the yeah. yellow tape. And it gets worse. And it gets worse. So Operation Yellow Tape is just that. And and I, I'm getting to the point now where I talk to folks who aren't first responders. Everybody has yellow tape. Whether you work at Allstate, whether you're a lawn care provider, your yellow tape is that job you're in. Whatever, whatever you are focused on doing, a professional podcaster, professional speaker, your yellow tape is that job you're inside of. But outside the yellow tape, man, mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually, financially, it all comes crumbling down if you don't take care of that stuff on the outside. So Operation Yellow Tape is just that. It's focusing on inside Yellow Tape, how hard that can be and how it is important for us to talk and uh, talk about what happens inside of Yellow Tape, explain to those who love us what we exactly do. Everybody thinks it's just putting wet stuff on the red stuff or putting handcuffs on people. It's so much more involvement than just that. And then talking to folks about what happens on the outside of Yellow Tape. Do you need a personal trainer? Do you need a financial advisor? Do you need a free consultation to leave the toxic relationship that you're in? You know, what can you do on the outside of the other tape to help you function on the inside? That's OYT. Yeah, that, that outside the yellow tape part is, is it, it affects everybody so differently, but it, it does affect you. I mean, there's so much going on in life and then we get b bombarded with, with all kinds of messages from, from social media, from TV, from actual media, from whatever it is, you just get bombarded and then you add that to the, uh, just the bullshit at, at, in, in the firehouse at times or the whatever, whatever the inside part of, of the yellow tape that you're talking about is because we all know like the, the meat of a job is not difficult necessarily. It's the, it's the ancillary stuff that makes that job difficult. So, you know, what do you mean? Okay. So I wore a hoodie today instead of my job shirt. Okay. So why is that an issue? Well, we, we all know what the argument is to why that's an issue, but it still becomes part of the bullshit. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and, and we don't get as first responders, whether you're in the fire service, the police, whether you're a dispatcher, whether you're ECC, a nurse, we have sleep hygiene <laughs> problems. So, so, so unlike some folks who get to come home after a stressful day and take a shower and jump into bed at 1030 and wake back up at five o'clock in the morning uninterrupted. We don't get that. So sleep deprivation is a huge part of, of the problems we're having. And I'm, and I'm telling you, I may not be here to see it, but in, in many years from now, they're going to understand that sleep deprivation, sleep deprivation caused so much of the injury, the illness, and the hurt in our lives in communication caused so much of the divorce. Everybody's always talking about, you know, this job causes divorce because of the schedule. You know, it's not always. Uh, our wives and husbands love us being gone for a day <laughs> so they can watch their own television show. It's the fact that we don't change. We change and they don't. Yeah, that, you know, we don't talk. We don't that's talk. That's a great point. It is. You know, we do change and we don't talk. And that does drive these divisions between you know, relationships and, and it does make sense. It, it is part of it. And I, I mean, I can raise my hand and say, that's, it's, it's a majority of why I'm a divorced person right now, you know, because of that, you know, I, 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 and I probably still don't know how to communicate. So I get that. And, and, and I try to tell people when I present it, there's a part of my help acronym called educate and it's, a, it's heavy on the signs and symptoms, but I've kind of reversed things too. It, you have to educate your family on what you do when, with these jobs. You know, there was so much about my job that Jessica didn't know. She didn't know that I had a report after every single yeah. call we ran. She really didn't know that we had target solutions and tell us staff. And, you know, there's so many things that happen in the fire service rather than just running calls. You, the chief knocks on the door and you got to go over here for this dog yeah. and pony show. You know, and then the next time somebody knocks on the door and there's 10 kids that want to see the firehouse for four hours. You know, th there's cleaning and, and weed eating and cutting the grass and who likes to eat what bread and who can cook and who can't cook and who's going to cook. It's a whole day. You can run no call sometimes and be completely exhausted because the tunes are going off above your head for every other place in the county. You can be exhausted. We don't do a good job of telling, and I didn't do a good job 
of telling people, yeah, we didn't have a single fire. I slept like crap there because yeah. it's loud and it, it smells funny and people are all over the place. Doing... We don't do a good enough job of explaining what we do, whether it's corrections, whether it's nursing, whether it's dispatching, fire, police, share. I don't, we just don't. We let television tell our family what we do. And that is not it. No, it's not. it. And, and you, you, I think you make a very valid point. And I think that we're starting to see it already, how much that sleep is going to blame for a lot of stuff health, physical or mental. Yeah. It's, I've had a couple of people on it to, to talk about sleep and, and it is, it is a killer. And I'll be honest with you. I think it's one of the main reasons I decided to step aside after 11 years, because I just saw what it was going to do to, to me as I get older. And you say that, you know, you're up there because you're, you were 50. I retired at 55. And so I, I did not want to do another nine years you know, and have that affect me into my, in, into my early sixties and seventies, because then it's, it's, it's exponential that the damage it would be done at that point, in my opinion. And the science says so as well. So that, that sleep is so important and you're right. We don't tell people what all that extra shit is that we do at the firehouse. You know, it's, yeah, we'll get to get a shower and get a sleep, but none of that is uninterrupted and none of that do you actually relax and, and take a breath when you're doing no. And, and people could be listening right now who are first responders and go, oh, woe is you guys. You chose to do it. Big deal. Well, you're right. And I wouldn't change anything about it. But what we need to do better is explain to you what we do. Explain to you why for 24 hours, 48 hours, I may not feel like going to Bush Gardens the second I walk in the door. I may need a little bit of a, of a, of a cool down period. I may have to drive on the block a little bit. I, I may, but I have to tell you that. Um, I just can't change and become this angry, aggravated, you know, you know, just hyper vigilant person who refuses to leave their backyard. If I don't, if I don't talk to you and, and, and help you while I change, because you're not spouses, friends, families, you know, my dad worked for City of Hopewell for 38 years in public works. He went to bed at 10. He woke mm -hmm. up at five for 35 years. You know, that's great. You know, he didn't change much with his sleep problems during his, his career. You know, he, he got sleep. We, we, we're getting better, but the in-services, you know, the, just there's so much involved with these professions that are just so much more than just lights and sirens and doing CPR and, and, and fighting fire. It's so much more. And I'm glad you made that decision, man. And you will, I'm going to go back a little bit. If anybody hasn't um, checked out three or four of your podcasts ago, when you talk about the transition out of the fire service, they need to check it out because I listened to that part of yours about 10 times. You absolutely nail what it's like to transition out and the feelings. And whether it's 11 years or 21 years, I don't think it matters, man. I don't. I think I have 10 more years of memories of the job than you do, but the, we did the same job. The, the calls are the same. The car wrecks are the same. The tight brotherhood is the same. But it's, it's not a, it's not a number like for, for 21 years, my retirement is so much more harder. No, I think for all of us, whether it's 11 years, 21 years, even five or six years, you build these friendships and then yeah, they're gone. The phone, well, not gone, but the, the text mm -hmm. thread stop, you know, a lot of the stuff kind of goes away and um, I'm glad you chose it and I'm glad I chose it because it, it's nothing it, it would not be worth getting into your 60s, you know, into your late 50s for me, for you to, to suffer these major medical problems that are coming our way already because of sleep deprivation. Maybe we can recover a little bit and gain a few years. So let's talk about Operation Yellow Tape and what your mission is today. What are you doing with it today? Today, lots of things. <laughs> um, my main mission, though, is to provide uh, quality resources for people. Who, who reach out to OIT, I, I present, there's a, 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 so many departments and organizations I have spoken to on a, on a, on a stage or, a, or a, a station or whatever, providing awareness on signs and symptoms. I love talking to, to spouses. Um, the mission is to, is to constantly drive forward uh, that we have hard jobs and we change and, and things happen to us along the way. Seeing some of this stuff isn't, isn't normal. We love it. We chose it. We're not going to do anything else, but 
well, you need to be, as someone who is in my life, educated on what is sleep deprivation, what is hypervigilance, what is depression, what, what is burnout, what is all of these things, and then how do we proactively get around them? And that's what I want to focus on. I don't want to focus on the sad stories, and I want, I want to teach you and me how do, we, how do we get help in our direction and start off from the very start. So the HELP acronym that I teach, I feel it, it, it's, it's becoming pretty successful. Um, I can tell you that uh, the Virginia Fire Office Academy is replacing my HELP acronym with stress, getting rid of stress first aid. Because I feel it's taking that one-year firefighter or whoever and that family member teaching them through the HELP acronym what they can do along the way, you know, what to look out for, what, to, what proactive steps to take. So, you know, to answer your question, it's about awareness. I'm, I'm putting events together. I have one coming up in September, bringing together people who are not in this uniform and who have never been in it before, people who are in it still, who used to be in it, and just letting our stories become someone's survival guide, just talk therapy, talking to each other, people sharing what's worked for them, what hasn't worked for them. I just see it as a platform and it's growing where people are coming out, man, I'm having chiefs reach out finally and say, Hey, I wouldn't mind speaking at your conference. Oh, really? <laughs> Chief? Yeah. I like that. So it's kind of where I, I'm, I'm taking this thing and it's, um, it's picking up speed and it's, and I've always had this, I've always had this idea that it's just one person hears it. It's just one person takes something away from you, you and I's conversation. If, if one person hears his story and mine and yours and gets, gets a little bit of help and gets better sleep, retires sooner, you know, it's, it, whatever, then I feel satisfied with the direction that OIT is going. But um, I, I so enjoy talking to the newer recruits um, because I don't feel you and I had that person no. who was able to come up and tell the truth. Right. Now, the truth mm -hmm. is scary. Um, you know, the, the, the truth isn't a retention tool for the fire service, but you're going to see bad things. And if you can't, if you can't, if you can't take seeing bad things, isn't the job for you for sure. You got to have coping mechanisms in place because you're going to continue to see them over and over and over and over again. I've told people before during my coaching, this might not be the job for you and that's okay. If you can't, if you can't find some mechanisms to get through this, then this might not be the career for you. Um, so we're hoping we can, I say we like have a mouse in my pocket. It's me with some help. I, I don't have a, I don't, my business isn't big enough to hire anyone. So it's me with some, some folks who help me. For, but that's the goal, man. I'm tired of seeing folks take their lives. I'm tired of seeing, I know that so many, so somebody right now is listening and they've been suffering for seven years right now. They're listening, going, everything they're saying is how I'm feeling. It's how I'm treating my wife, my husband, myself. I don't love myself as much. I love the strangers. I'm feeling this. Well, we're talking to you. So it's time for you to step up and get some help. So you mentioned it, and, and I'm not sure how much you want to go into it, but I, I know you're proud of it. So what is the HELP acronym? Well, the HELP acronym is, stands for Health, Educate, Launch, and People. Um, at, cer at a certain point during all of this, I kept getting asked, Kenny, we've heard what Operation Yellow Tape is about. We know how operate inside Yellow Tape is hard. We know outside of Yellow Tape caused all the injuries, but what did you do to get where you're at? Well, believe me, um, like all of us, I'm still a work in progress. I have way more better days than I yeah. have tough days, but believe me, I have tough days still because a post-traumatic injury is there for life. But it starts off with health, putting health first, You know, talking about our diets, talking about working out and then health in an input. What kind of podcast are you listening to? Are you wake up and listen to the news and getting pissed off mm. immediately? Then we go into the educate part. We educate um, the audience on, on the signs and symptoms of a mental health decline. Then we educate them on what our job entails. Then we go into the launch part of um, acronym, launching yourself into getting help. I sit back for way too long waiting for someone to save me. No one's coming to save you. You're going to hear plenty of podcasts going to hear some information. No one's coming to save you, but you, you're going to, you're going to get some great advice. You're going to have some mentors, some stories are going to affect you, but you have to launch yourself into getting help. Is it, is it physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual, financial? What help do you need? And the second you realize it, the second you take a weed eater and bust it against the wall and argue with people constantly and get pissed off nonstop, cry in your car, punch your steering wheel, cry 
go launch yourself. Find someone like myself, like you, someone who's been through something and reach out to them. Let them help you take those steps. And then it, the P is for the people. Who are the people around us? Who are in the rooms we're in? What podcast are you on? Who, what, what family members have you had to say goodbye to because they're no longer able to get along anymore and they're continuing to bring the drama to your life? And that's hard for some people to think that family members, they have to say goodbye to. I have two in my life who are no longer in my life because I sit down with them and try to tell them, you're doing this, I'm doing this. How do we stop this bull crap? Well, one more time. You're doing this, I'm doing this. Couldn't work. You got to go. My life is so much better. So the HELP acronym kind of takes you from, from look at yourself and loving yourself more than you love the strangers all the way to the people who you need to have in your corner. And we try to walk them through. They take, take some notes, some things you want to see improve in your life. If it's weight, if, if, it's, if it's finances, write it down. And we use the HELP acronym to try to uh, get them to a better place. And so what, who's your audience these days? I know you mentioned recruits or, or some classes, but who else are you, who else are you speaking to? Who, who are you presenting to? Well, I've, I'm presenting um, in the next couple of weeks. I'll be at the Virginia Fire Office Academy, University of Richmond, talking to um, newly promoted lieutenants. Um, I have spoken to Allstate. I have spoken to the International um, Richmond Airport. So I guess my audience is really... Um, a lot of first responders, um, I've really got into the AP, uh, CO, the dispatchers Been speaking to dispatchers a lot lately, um, graduations of recruits, but recently I've had this, this corner where these companies reaching out to me, like that's how the airport got involved. It's like, you know, we've had multiple suicides in, in 10 years and you don't have to be a first responder, Kenny, to suffer from mental health illnesses. I'm like, and well, and wellness process, I know. So the audience seems to be any of these decision makers who are wanting to bring awareness to their members and to their teams and to their families. Um, you know, in, in, in September, I'll be in Wisconsin. I don't know if you remember a couple of Christmases ago, a guy got in a van and he ran through a yeah. crowd and he, you know, well, that they, they hired me to, to, to be there. It's the, it's the, it's the ER directors, the, the firefighters, the nurses, all these years later, and they luckily they got a, a proactive decision maker who, hey, let's get some people, not just me, let's get some people in line and do some training with awareness. So my audience, it's it really varies. It's heavy, it's heavy first responders, but it's turning into heavy first responders and their spouses and their families. And it's also turning into like I was just um yesterday, you know, no first right. responders, pilots, you know, companies who want their teams to be healthy. You know, you don't have to be a first responder to have a mental health. Uh, no, and I think that if anybody follows sports, we saw that the other the other week when a, a, you know, a pretty high-level golfer on the PGA uh, course, or excuse me, not course, but on he's participates or did participate in the PGA. He's 30 years old. He's won two different tour victories, and, and he killed himself. You know, it, it, this right. runs across, this runs the gamut of people. It doesn't matter what your job is. People are, are, are killing themselves. And you know, yes. And, and, and will we ever stop it? No, we won't. But we can give people hope who are right there on that fence. You know, give them hope. You know, just before you, ah, you know, there's so much science behind the yeah. frontal lobe being destroyed and different things. But that's a different conversation for people much smarter than I am. But I, I always plead with people when I'm presenting, give somebody a chance to hear you, to see you, and to let them at least throw some resources your way before you make that irreversible decision that you can't get back from this. It's a bomb off in your family for generations yeah. to come. Your grands, your, your children's children, children will talk about it. And it's, it's, there's help available. There really is. And there's so much that we can work through. And, you know, I lost three friends in the month of May. It's astonishing. Two first responders, one not. Um, it just, but it takes you. It takes, it takes you, meaning me. It takes me, because you're not always, I have this saying, you, you know, you must become fierce in the early recognition of a mental health decline and those you love, live with, work with, and most importantly, yourselves. And right. I believe that. You and I have to become fierce, but it takes me. My signs and symptoms were, were, were I was masterful <laughs> at hiding yeah. them. 
You know, people saw some people saw a little bit, but you have got to come forward and lay down that shield and say, I just need yeah. some help. I'm struggling. I'm not doing well. I don't want it to be broadcasted everywhere, but it because not everybody's going to see no. your signs. Not everybody's going to notice that you're struggling. No. And we got to get away from that, too, where it, it's all on me and you to notice it. No. It's got to be on you as well. You have to be brave enough and know that you're going to be okay. You know what happened to me when I came out in 2020 and told folks that I was struggling with depression and hypervigilance and anxious? You know what happened What's to that? me? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. I yeah. got support. I, I got love. I, I got help. I got resources. I had about 27 people to come out for and said, dude, I feel like you felt. Nothing happened. Nothing. You know, there's some people probably look at me as maybe, you know, Maybe he's doing this, you know, mental health is the thing. And that wasn't in 2020, wasn't the thing. It still isn't the thing to come forward and no. say you're struggling. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. So, but for those folks listening right now, trust me, when you do come forward and you do admit that you're struggling, you got to be okay because nothing is going to really change if you're going to feel better again. And those folks who don't like it, Babe Ruth said it the best. Yeah. The loudest booze will come from the cheapest seats from those who invest the least in your lives. And you can tell them goodbye and you'll feel much better anyway. So come forward. Tell me about your conference. Oh, my conference is September 14th here in Chesterfield, Virginia. And I hope that's where I'm going to meet you for the first time. Um, <laughs> I hope you can make it. Um, it's going to be here in Chesterfield at the Beulah Rec Center. I'm moving locations because it's All gotten right. bigger. I've got five. I've got five speakers lined up. We talk about a um, couple speakers talk about signs and symptoms. We've got Valen Vital Health coming, talking about testosterone replacement and how much low T mimics depression and anxiety. Yeah. I got Bill Horse Coffee. Yeah, man, we've got sponsors. We've got a live DJ. I've got someone coming to sing the national anthem. We got raffles. It's just a whole bunch of fun first responders, mostly non first responders. Family's up. Tom's family comes now. They've been the past two years, which has been so amazing to me. It makes me very emotional. His mom and dad couldn't come the first year. It was too hard for them, but they've been there um, the last year and are coming this year. So basically, man, it's six hours. Uh, Marcus Torgerson, um, who's a good friend of mine, is coming down to, to speak on the stage and also do a little workshop. Um, so we're, we're teaching those productive practices, uh, talking about mindset. It's just a, a six hours full of... Um, a catered lunch, some pale horse coffee, some, some, this, a different, this filling your inner circle, man, networking. And you don't really know. A lot of folks reach out to me and they say, you know, well, I don't know how to build my inner circle. I, I don't have any friends. Well, start going to places where you, you might not think right. you find people. I had seven people last year show up to my event who had no idea what the <laughs> hell it was. They saw, they saw me on Channel 6 News talking. They're like, what is this operation? Keep calling it Yellow Project. It's Operation Yellow Tape, y'all. They were saying Operation Yellow Project. <laughs> They're like, man, this is what I needed because right. they met people. You know, they were artists. They met a guy who wants them to paint a flag now. Some of them were podcasters last year. Their podcasting guests right. went through the roof. Some of them, some of them were swag guys. They're selling t-shirts. It's just the it's networking. It's who we're around. It's coming out of our comfort zone and rubbing elbows of people like minded who struggled and who support those who have struggled. And that's what my conferences are all about. And um, I'm looking forward to this one. It, it, we're going to bring. Yeah, it maybe show. I'll bring a, a couple of mics down and, and, and just talk to people as we go. I was thinking that we need to talk um, off here in a couple of days. And I, you might want to think about maybe doing a live podcast there or something, man, have people come over. But it's, it's so much opportunity. If anything, I'd love to have you there, sit up yeah. at the table, you know, have your sweat. I, you, you're doing amazing work, man. I, I don't know. Um, how much you hear about how, how, who you're affecting, but the things we all carry is on the streets. Uh, there's not many folks over here who don't talk about it. You're doing great work. And uh, well, I, love I appreciate that kind words. I, I don't know if I, if I deserve them yet or not, but I'm working on it. Let's uh, let's get to those last two questions of mine, unless you got something else you want to share real quick. No, I don't have anything to share. You know, if, if anybody's interested in, in coming to the event, you know, just go to my website, um, I'm sure you'll, you'll have that. Go to my website and register. I do need to, I'm going to have to cut that off soon because I got to get a head count right. for my food. It's, it, it is free. It's a free event to you. If you're interested in, in coming to the event, please um, set it up on my website. I really appreciate that. I also have a newsletter that goes out here and there, but uh, please come to the conference. You know, bring a friend. Uh, 
but just sign up by July, July 15th. So I can get myself a food. And in case you guys <laughs> don't, don't check out the notes. That's uh, Kenny Mitchell Jr.com. Correct. Yes, sir. Kenny Mitchell Jr.com. Um, just go in there with, uh, with your name, uh, a good email, and then how many tickets you want. That way it'll give me a head count. And then you just show up and uh, parking is free. The event, you walk in the door. It used to be at a golf club the past two years, which was very confusing for people because a lot of folks like, I don't golf. I'm like, well, I don't really golf either. It's just here because it's beautiful. So I changed it to the Beulah Rec Center because the Beulah Rec Center has one stage, has a really nice area for seating. When you, do, when you start doing these events, you learn yeah. from your mistakes. So uh, there's a nice bathroom, just nice showers. You know, we've got six hours. So um, I just, uh, I would just hope folks would show up and, 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 and we're going to, I think we had 47 my first year, 78 last year. This place holds about 258. I don't really, I'm not sure. I think 258 is too many. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to cap it about 125. All right. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to it. So we'll, we'll talk in a, in a couple of days and we'll figure out the logistics and stuff. And now the time has come, because I know we talked about it before. That's uh, let's talk about a moment of awe you've experienced and, and, and kind of the why behind uh, it. Well, that's, um, it, it's funny that, um, I'm going to read yeah. something. Okay. Th this is my moment of, 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 of why I'm putting my glasses for it. This is an area. <laughs> so my daughter, my daughter wrote this to me when I retired. Um, I had always wanted, I had hoped my career would have taught her something, you know, uh, she, this is the only job she ever knew. So on my Facebook page, she wrote this <clears throat> almost 21 years of selfless service, life-saving awards, loving the broken on the streets, fighting fires, putting smiles on people's faces and changing the community around you. You've accomplished so much in your career, and I am blessed to have been a part of so much of it. Watching the work has taught me so much about life. You are a true embodiment of hard and dedicated worker. Though the journey hasn't been easy, you've seen some horrible things, lost some incredible friends. You did it. You made it right where you want to be. Kenny Mitchell in 2001 would be in awe of where you are standing right now. The uniform you got to wear for all those years the things you've seen, the things you've done, the people you know, he is proud of you. And so am I. Here's to the next endeavor in life and the change you're going to continue to make. Congratulations to my dad, Lieutenant yeah. Mitchell. So, so brother, yeah. she said it right there. The Kenny Mitchell of 2001 is in awe of where he is today. And that's my all moment is because with all of the struggle and all of the pain and all of the hurt, I am in awe and excited and proud uh, that I'm here. I'm talking to you today, that I had the courage to step up and to put myself first and to ask for help. There you go. I like it. I like it. It's perfect. What about a book, my friend? What about a book to, to recommend to the audience? You know, I would recommend... I, I would recommend the book Touching the Dragon by Jimmy I've Hatch. never heard of it. Uh, Jimmy is a former military man out of Norfolk, uh, Virginia. Um, he wrote the book, Touching the Dragon. I read it for the first time in 2018. Um, and no, it is not a big, gigantic war story. Um, it is more so about his mental health struggles and how he overcame them and where he is now and how he's doing. And yeah, I would highly recommend it. I have so many others, of course, you know, I work with dudes who write books, but Jimmy, that book, that book was a, a, a major, I read it in 2018. I was on the verge yeah. of, of, of asking for some help. Two, two years that, 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 that decision came kind of my way. But yeah, man, Jimmy Hatch is touching the dragon. I will. Check it out. I, I've got it pulled up right now, so I'll, I'll give it a look. Well, my friend. It's an amazing. I appreciate the too. time you just spent with us. Brother, I appreciate this more than ever. I've been looking forward to this. I appreciate you being flexible and so get showing me grace uh, on my scheduling oh. conflicts and I, i'm just i love your podcast i love what you do and i just want to tell you keep driving forward and uh, keep doing what you're doing i, I, I love the work um, but remember don't work yourself in the ground 
the, the balance you're working now. I like I like the two part series stuff. I think you're uh, well, somewhere. Something. My friend TJ is is sitting there cheering you on because he's been he's been bugging me. A couple other people have been bugging me about it to to slow it down and and break them up. So somewhere people are cheering you on. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Things We All Carry. Head over to the website thethingsweallcarry.com for show notes, resources, and to sign up for the newsletter. Until next week, take care of yourselves and remember to check in on each other.